But when you just think about that, that term, game time, right? In, in its simple form, game time is the time the game starts, right? It's in, in the term. Uh, but really, there's much more to it than just the time that it begins. It's more of a statement, right? Like if it's, if it's time to play and you're like, man, it's game time. It's not just about the clock. It's, it's like it's time to get to work, right? It's time to do what needs to be done. And I would say to you right now, uh, living in this country, the things we're going through, it's game time. Amen? Right? It's time for us to get to work. It's time for us to do things that need to be done. We're just nine days, if you can believe it, from electing uh, the next president of the United States of America, what could be a real turning point in our nation. I believe it's going to be a turning point. It's just which way are we turning? Uh, but we need to get out and vote, right? I mean, it's more than just a right. See, I think people that choose not to vote, they're like, well, it's a right. It's not something I have to do. It's something I can do. But, but I think that it's actually more than a right. I believe it's actually a duty. I believe that you owe it to the people who protect this great nation. I believe you owe it to the kids that we just sent out of here who they don't get to vote yet. And to your grandkids that are to come. And after that, and after that, we have a duty to vote, right? We owe it to people who are not able or have sacrificed so much. So as we near election day, I want to encourage you to vote by the leading of the Holy Spirit for the candidates, not just president, but all down the, uh, down the line, but the candidates that best line up with the word of God. I'm saying that should be 100% our measuring stick. How do they line up with the word of God? Listen, they all stink. But you know what? If it was you or me running, we would stink too. You know why? Because we're still flawed people. None of us are going to be perfect. But, but I'm saying, how do they best line up with the word of God? Not how do they line up with my feelings? Not how do they line up with my emotions the things that I want, that I desire, how do they line up with the word of God? And I want to remind you that, again, they're not perfect, but you're also not voting for a savior. You realize that. The person who takes office in January is not, will not, never will be a savior. Because there's only one, and his name is Jesus. We're not voting for a savior. You're not even voting for a pastor. You're voting for a politician. Okay, so what are their policies? What are their ethics? And how do they line up with your moral values? That, church, is how we vote. Why do I bring this up, of all things? What does this have to do with game time? What does it have to do with football? What does it have to do with the scriptures? You and I are responsible for what we do with the truth. You realize that? We're responsible for what we do with the truth. See, the Word of God is not given to us so freely just for us to be able to win arguments. You realize that? It's not just given to us to be able to win arguments. It's not given to us to be able to put other people down who disagree. It's to reveal what's right. Not just what's right, but what's right in the eyes of God. And ultimately, it's to point people to Jesus. That's what the scriptures are for. To know what's right and to point people to Jesus. And I'll tell you, what does our country need more than anything right now? They need to know what's right and they need to be pointed to Jesus. And they need that more than they need any specific person to become president. They need it more. And we're the ones who have it. And what are we doing with it? See, our job is to please God. That's my job as a Christian, to please God. Now, if you're not an actual follower of Jesus, if you haven't made that decision to accept the free gift of salvation paid for by his blood on the cross, then it's not your job to please him. Because people can get caught up in the whole uh, earning salvation. Am I doing enough to make God happy? I've heard so many people say that. I don't know 
where he's going to tell me I'm going at the end of the line because I don't know if I've done enough to make him happy. Newsflash, you haven't. You have not done enough to make God happy because that's not how you get saved. It's by faith in Jesus Christ and faith in him alone. So if you're not saved, if you haven't given your life to, to God, then your job is not to please him because I don't want you to get caught up in a, have I done enough? You can't earn salvation. It's not dependent on what you do, but on what he did. You accept it, you receive it. But listen, if you are saved, if you have given your life to Christ, then you've committed to living a life led by the Spirit. And I'll tell you what the Spirit leads you to do. Please God. That's what he leads us to do in every situation in our life. The Holy Spirit is leading you to please the Father. What things do I do that are pleasing to God? What does he desire of me? How do I believe his word? How do I trust him with what he says? And this is what our game time is all about. Again, no matter who pres the president is, it's about, it's time for the church to go do what has to be done. It's time for us to get to work and to focus on the work of the kingdom. In Mark chapter 4, verse 24 and 25, Jesus said, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. But whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Take heed what you hear. This phrase right here is the key to the rest of the entire passage. Take heed what you hear. Some translations will say take care of what you hear. You know, we should take care of the Word of God. We should guard it. We should protect it. But I want to tell you, this means something a little deeper here. It means something a little more specific than just to take care of the Word. Take heed in the original Greek is this word blepo. And this word blepo is deep. It means to see. Okay, so we got to see something first. But it means to perceive with the eyes, to gaze upon to feel, to discover by use, and to experience. See, this word blepo involves a process. So when we take heed of what we hear, it's a process, right? When you hear the truth, you hear the word of God, you first have to see it, right? You first have to look at it. You first have to, like, what did God say? That matters. That's important. Then you've got to perceive it. This is really where we just become aware of it. We recognize that it's God that said this. It's not just some idea. It's not just a good plan, but God said this. But then we go a little bit deeper and we start to gaze upon it. This is where we look at what God has said steadily and intently, right? With some curiosity, with some kind of desire to know more and if we continue to follow what that word means, the next thing it says is that you feel it, right? Have you ever read something in the Bible and maybe you've read it over and over and you've studied it or you've thought about it, you've meditated on it, and one day it's like it, it, you feel it, right? It's like the Holy Spirit begins to make it real to you. He begins to reveal it to your heart. And then you go a little bit further, it says that you discover it by use. It's like now that I've read it and I recognize that it's God and I've meditated on it and I've gazed upon it and I feel it, now it's starting to apply to my life. It's starting to change the way that I live and the way that I do things. And then finally you experience it. It's like, man, I am living the word of God. What he has said is true, but now it's true in me. This is what the scripture means when it says to take heed of what you hear. This is the response that you and I are to have 
to God's word. There's a reason that it all starts here. Because there's a lack of reverence for God's word in the world today. I'm going to tell you there's even a lack of reverence for God's word in the church today. There really is. There's people that hear it, but then they dismiss it. Or they hear it, but then it, they don't agree with it. It doesn't match how they feel or what they want or what they think. But can I tell you something this morning? That the truth of God's word is true no matter if you agree with it or not. It's still true. See, how we feel about it doesn't actually change the fact that it's true. And what you do with it affects the rest of your life, but also the lives of those that are all around you. He said, take heed what you hear, because with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And you who hear, more will be given. See, what you hear is important, but it's equally important how you hear it. What measure are we using in our hearing? Is it just that, yeah, that's nice. It's nice that the Bible says some of these things that make me feel good, or are we taking heed, right? Are we working through this process where we take a verse that maybe it, it speaks to us a little bit, but we're actually gonna immerse ourselves in it, and we're gonna say, man, I need to understand that. Holy Spirit, will you reveal that to me? Are we going through this process that involves a response from me, but also permission for me to let the Holy Spirit work in my life? Or are we just hearing the word of God and it goes in one ear and out the other? Are we cherry picking the scriptures, right? I like this one. Eh, that one doesn't feel very good. I don't want to listen to that, but I like this part of it. Are we using the scripture out of context to line up with our feelings and our thoughts and our desires? You know, there's two primary types of preaching. One is expository. That's where you take the word of God and you break it down. You explain it. And then there's topical. And, and topical can be expository at the same time. But a lot of preachers preach a topical uh, sermon where it's, here's my idea and so if I take this part of this verse and this part of this verse, they help to prove my idea. Like, that's not the way that we preach here. We preach by the word of God. And then if I can come up with an analogy or a, an a illustration that fits and helps to explain that, like a parable, like Jesus did, then I'll do that. But church, we've got to be rooted in the word of God, first and foremost, not what we think and how we feel. It will be measured to you in the same measure that you use. I'm convinced. And you can try to prove me wrong. I'd love to hear if you have another idea, but I'm convinced that when a person is not spiritually growing, it's simply because of the measure that they're using when they hear God's word. It's simply the measure they're using when they hear God's word. Is it just, again, Okay, that's I, I read my chapter of the Bible. Forget about it. I'm moving on with my day. Because the same measure that you use is the measure that it will be given back to you. Right? If you hear, more will be given. What more? What is he talking about? That more will be given. More understanding. Right? You who hear, like you hear in this way where you're actually taking the word of God and you're working through this process and letting it change your life, you who do that, more will be given. You'll understand more. More will be able to be applied to your life. More transformation and ultimately all those things translate to more growth in our lives. Verse 25, he said, for whoever has to him, more will be given, but whoever does not have even what he has will be taken Away. Your effort does matter. Your effort in regards to the Word of God matters. Church, it's that simple process of sowing and reaping. What are you doing with it? Because it will have an impact on what you're going to get. So, what are we doing with the Word of God? Do you consider it in 
game time, right? In a, a football game, when a player's thrown the ball before he does anything else, what does he have to do? Catch the ball, right? He has to receive what has been given to him. It's the most important step. Can he do anything without the ball? No, nothing of value. You can see it. He can run around all day long. He can run all the way down to the end zone. He can pretend he scored a touchdown, but did he? No. Other people are like, you goon, what are you doing? You don't have the ball. Like, football's all about the ball. Right? And for us, Right? Christianity, it's all about the Word of God. Everything has to involve the Word of God. It's the most important step. See, this person in football, if they begin to run, if you are a football watcher, you see this sometimes. If the ball's thrown to them and they start to turn and try to run when they haven't caught the ball yet, guess what happens? Boink, right? It bounces off their shoulder. They, they get nowhere. They usually drop the ball. And a player that receives the ball that was thrown to him, if he can do that one simple thing of just catch the ball, guess what? It'll be thrown to him again, and again, and again, and again. All day long, he'll get the most opportunities. Why? Just because he can do the simple thing of just catch the ball. Just the simple thing of just catching the ball. On the other hand, what happens to the guy who drops the ball every time? that it gets thrown to him, right? He's not going to get very many more balls thrown his way, even if he's wide open. And you know what the other, the defense will do? They'll leave that guy wide open. They're like, that guy can't catch. He's not going to do anything with it if he gets it. Why does it matter if he's going to drop the ball? You know, in an actual game, you have these other excuses too. You have the, the quarterback could not make a good throw. The coach could call a bad play. But you know who doesn't get that excuse? Us. We don't have that kind of excuse in Christianity where the, the ball is the word of God. We got Jesus calling the plays and we got the Holy Spirit delivering the truth. Listen, it's always the right play. It's always in the right place. It's always on time and it's never their fault. It's what are we doing with what we are given. I can promise you today that the word of God is for today. It's accurate. It's on time. It's necessary like a ball in football. You realize you can't even play the game of football without a ball? You can play it without a foot, but you can't play it without a ball. I'm not saying it'd be easy. I'm just saying you could. You could play football without a foot, but you can't play it without a ball. But what are we doing with God's Word? How often are Christians trying to live a God-pleasing life without the Word. Where are we going and what are we doing? We're like a guy running to the end zone without the ball. It's like, what are you celebrating? You don't even have the, the thing that you were supposed to take there, right? It's the truth that sets people free. And if we don't have that, we don't have any business doing anything. What are we doing with the Word? Is the Bible a novelty item to you? Is it something you keep on the coffee table, again, just for when people come to your house, they're like, oh, they got a Bible sitting on there. They must read that. Is it just a novelty item? Here's a good question for you to consider. When's the last time that you picked it up and you read it? When's the last time that you looked up some verses that apply to what you're going through, or they apply to what somebody in your life is going through, that you could, again, you could read it, you could let the Holy Spirit work it in you, and then you could share it with them. When's the last time that you've done something like that with the Word of God? Listen, this isn't to make you feel bad, this, I'm just trying to be real. The Holy Spirit is the convictor today, not me. That's not my job. My job is to share the truth. And the truth is, that we are to take heed of what we hear. And to the measure we use, it'll be measured back to us. Matthew 13, 12, Matthew puts it a little bit different. He says, for whoever has to him, more will be given, and he will have 
abundance, but whoever does not have even what he has will be taken, taken away from him. Whoever has, has what? This ability to comprehend the spiritual truth. There's a lie that the enemy tells people that you can't understand what God has said. Has anybody ever believed that lie before? That you can't understand something in the Bible. That you don't have the ability. That's not for you to, maybe somebody else could understand that. But that, but you can't understand that. Can I tell you that that's, that's a, a lie? The Lord does not just give certain people the ability to understand his word. But I'll tell you what is the hang-up sometimes is the people who take heed, they will get more understanding. And so if we're not understanding it, maybe we're not taking heed. Maybe we're not working through that process of saying, okay, I'm going to read it. I'm going to recognize that this is what God said, and I'm going to, I'm going to meditate on it. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit, right? Sometimes this takes time, church. Sometimes it takes time. Time. I know Bud is, uh, as one of the best Bible teachers I've ever been around, has told me about the hours and hours he spent in certain passages just reading it, meditating on it. How does it connect to other passages just to get understanding? And so if you just talk to him, you think, man, how does this guy know so much? I'm going to tell you what, probably as much or more than anybody that I know, he takes heed what he hears. He takes heed, he, he takes it and processes it in that way. And when we do that, church will be given more. And the scripture says more to the point that we will have an abundance. That we'll have an abundance of understanding of the word of God. Think about what it means to have an abundance. That word means to be, to be over. Like whatever the point is, whatever the, the limit is, that you're over that limit. And so the, the abundance in, in a picture, like you picture a cup of water that's already full, it's at the limit. You can't put any more in it. If you pour more water in that cup, that's abundance, right? It's going to begin to flow over. It's going to overflow onto the table and whatever else is around it. And if you know someone who knows the word of God, that it just seems to overflow out of them. It doesn't happen by accident. It's not just some supernatural gifting that was imparted on them. Yes, we can receive that for certain scriptures at certain times. But I'm just going to say if, if in their life they have this overflow of understanding of the scripture, it's not by accident. And it wasn't just a supernatural impartation of you never have to put any work in. You're just going to know everything. It didn't happen like that. It happened. That's the evidence that they revere God's word and they take heed what they hear. And that's the impact that it has on their life. And the impact it has on your life is that you are recipients of that overflow. It goes where this place where we go beyond just reading it for knowledge, but we read it to shape our lives. Is that the place that you're in in your life, that you read the word to shape your life? Listen, if you're going to read the word for it to shape your life, guess what's going to happen? It means there's going to be something in there that doesn't agree with how you live your life. It doesn't agree with what you think. It doesn't agree with what you feel. It doesn't agree with what you want. That's how it whips you into shape. It says, hey, you got a little extra over here, right? You want that gone? Here's what you got to do. And you're like, oh, well, I've been doing this. I've been, I've been doing curls with that, hoping this over here on the side will go away. And the word of God's like, no, dude, maybe you need to do a little cardio. Maybe you need to do some sit-ups. Maybe you need to do some, like, the word of God, if you want it to shape your life, it's going to show you what's out of shape. It's going to show you what doesn't fit in the image of Christ that the Holy Spirit is trying to conform your life to. 
We don't just read it for knowledge, but to shape our lives, right? To help us to know Jesus intimately. Can I tell you another thing the enemy has done? He's taken a word like this intimately, right? We think about intimacy as, as really something that should be reserved for husbands and, and wives. I would agree with that if you're talking about sexual intimacy. That is something that should be reserved between husbands and wives. However, that word intimacy does not always mean sexual, right? You can have an intimate relationship with people. You can have an intimate relationship with Jesus. It's a closeness, right? It's a, a special intimate relationship because you're near to them, you're close to them. And, and so the enemy has taken that word and made it weird when we apply it to the Lord. But listen, you should have an intimate relationship with Jesus. He should know you closely and you should know him closely. This is what we receive out of taking heed the word of God. And it leads us to a place of living a life that is pleasing to God. To know what his will is for the life that he gave us. Do you want to know what God's will is for your life? There's a couple of scriptures that say this is the will of God. But what is it for your life? I mean, that's not a one-sentence answer. Right? It, it's a lot of things. It starts first and foremost that you would know him and know him intimately. Then out of that, he begins to show you what he wants you to do with the rest of your life. Do we desire to give Jesus the reward for his suffering on the cross? That he could get what he paid for. What did he pay for? A relationship with you. You ever really thought about it in that way? I think sometimes we minimize the work on the cross to think he did that so I could go to heaven. But why? Why does he want you to go to heaven? Because he wants an intimate relationship with you. He wants to know you, church. That's why he suffered and died. Luke 12, 48 says, For everyone to whom much is given, from much will be required. And to whom much has been committed, of him they will ask the more. You know, people that are asked a lot of them. Has anybody ever got sick of that? Where it's like, it seems like people ask a lot of you, you're like, man, like people are always asking me to, to do stuff. Listen, why do, people, why do they do that? Well, people are asked a lot of them when they were faithful with little, simple things. Right? It should actually be an honor when somebody asks you to do something especially if we're asked to do something for the Lord. It means we've done well with something previously. It means we've proven our faithfulness or our ability to do something in the past, right? When you're not ever asked to do anything, that might be when you should be a little bit worried. You might start to think, where have I fallen short? Where have I not been able to hold up my end of, of a deal? But when we think about this player, again, that catches the ball consistently, again, he's going to get it more, and he's going to get it more. But the more he gets it, something happens. The more resistance he begins to face. Right? The guy who gets the ball over and over and over, the opponent begins to game plan on how do I stop that person from getting the ball? What do we got to do? What scheme... Think about this word for a minute. What scheme do we have to, to put out there to prevent this person from getting the ball? He faces more and more resistance and gets to a place where he has to begin to fight for the ball. And then if he does catch it, what happens? Somebody's trying to knock him down. Somebody's trying to take the ball from him. Church, so goes the truth in the world today. All that I've said today from the scriptures is true. And the Holy Spirit will give you more understanding. And you'll have an overflow if you take heed. If you see, you perceive, you gaze upon it, you feel it, you discover it, you experience it. 
all these things. But church, you know what's going to happen? If that's you, you will certainly face more resistance. The question is, are you willing to continue to fight for the truth? Are you willing to continue to fight for it? People are going to try to knock you down. They're going to try to take it from you. They're going to try to tell you that is not right. They're going to try to tell you, well, that meant that in that day, but it doesn't mean that today. Or they're going to try to tell you the original language didn't mean that. It actually meant this, and they have no idea what they're talking about because a lot of people have no clue what they're talking about when it comes to uh, speaking against the truth of the Word of God. They just think if they talk the loudest and talk the most and sound confident, that everybody will believe that they're right. Isn't that what we see the most in the media? Church, the truth is the truth. And if you are a person that receives that truth and does something with it, people are going to fight you, try to knock you down, and try to take it from you. But the truth is not determined by our feelings. It's not determined by what makes you happy. It's not determined by this book that some people declare to be a man-made book. It's determined by what God has said. In John 17, 17, Jesus is in prayer to the Father, and he says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Think about it. Jesus is proclaiming this to the Father. Will you sanctify them in the truth? What is that? Sanctifying. Sanctification is that process. The Holy Spirit works sin out of our life, works impurities out of our life, works things out that are not of God. It's a process. And Jesus prays to the Father, sanctify them in the truth. There's nothing else that's needed, church, besides the truth. Nothing else is needed. He says it's your word. It's all about your word. Your word is the truth. If people want to live a godly life, what do they need? They need your word. If people want to be changed, what do they need? They need your word. Yes, I know the Holy Spirit has an active part in this. I've shared it. He's the one. He's the one that makes the truth real to us. But I'll tell you what, we still got to have the word. And if we consider the fact that the world we live in right now, that it's game time, then the question for me and for you this morning is, are we ready to do what has to be done? Are we ready to get to work? Are we ready to take this truth and let it shape our life, but also take it everywhere we go? We have multiple people in this church that run businesses. And I praise God that they run their business in a way that lines up with God's word. And I'll tell you what, they're all blessed because of it. They're all blessed because of it. Church, God will do amazing things in your life. Things that are unexpected and unexplainable and things you can't plan. If you'll be a person that will take heed of his word. If you'll be a person that will live your life by it. And that the way you treat others will be impacted by his word. As we consider the fact that our world needs the truth more than it needs anything else, including a president, it's up to us. I, I don't think we can just continue to sit on the sideline and just hope that God does all this work. Because when we think like that, I think we forget what Jesus' plan is. I think we forget about the fact that Jesus is like, peace out, right? I'm going to sit on the throne, but I'm going to give all this authority to who? To you, to me, to the church. So are we using it? Are we doing what we need to do with the truth of God that is the only hope for this world? The only hope is the truth because it's the truth that will sanctify people. It's the truth that saves 
It's the truth that sets free. It's the truth that empowers. It's the truth that conforms and shapes and molds. It's the truth that helps us to recognize what should be conviction and what should not. It's the truth that helps us to know what's of God and what's the enemy. What's the, the good voice in my head and what's just some crazy tacos that I ate last night. It's the truth, guys. Right? Would you stand with me? Father, I pray this morning that you would help each and every one of us to receive the truth that you have for us. That as we read the word of God, that we would have open hearts to take heed and to understand. Lord, we don't want to be like a player that drops the ball and, and gets benched. Lord, we don't want to just have to run better routes, Lord, and anticipate throws to the right spot, but Lord, we can only do what we need to do when we take heed and we take the word of God and we treat it like the treasure it is. We treat it like the blessing it is. We revere it in a way that it needs to be revered. I pray that you teach us like a football player has to go to the, to the study room. And he has to study film, Lord. Would you help us to, in, to prioritize that time in the secret place? Lord, would we sit and we read our word and we pray and we listen for your voice? Lord, would you help us in studying the word of God like a player would study plays so that way we do know what we should be doing and where we should be. Lord, we reveal to us the fact that we have the greatest coach that we could ever hope for, that the Holy Spirit can show us where we've messed up and bring conviction upon our lives. Lord, he can tell us what we should have done differently when he brings sanctification into our lives. Lord, will you help us to take heed and, and follow the advice and the leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, we thank you that Jesus paid the price to allow us to even be on the team in the first place. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Lord, let us be faithful with every opportunity that you've given us in this game of life. Lord, let us be world changers because we're those who take heed of the truth, that we love the truth, that we cherish the truth, but Lord, that we live by the truth. I pray you'd have your way with each and every one of us today. You know what we need more than we need, more than we know ourselves. So as we enter back into worship, we pray, Holy Spirit, you would speak to our hearts. Let us hear your voice above all others. We pray you silence the voice of the enemy, that you'd even silence our own thoughts and our own desires right now so that we could hear what it is that you have to speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.